Thank you very much. So I'm Henry Stewart from Visualize, and we're a virtual reality production company based in London. And we've tried to source the world's very best VR specialists and bring them all here and create these experiences. So over the last two and a half years, we've actually done around 30 different virtual reality experiences in all kinds of different areas. Um, but VR, though, I just want to state first of all that it's not a new thing. It's been around since the 80s and the 90s when it was actually meant to be the next big thing then. Um, there was NASA doing experiments, there was army experiments, there was gaming like this brilliantly kind of retro looking set. Um, and then it was in popular culture. So there was like the Lawnmower Man, Red Dwarf, um, and everyone thought it was going to be the next really big thing. But then it went completely dead. And for about 20 years as well, it went completely dead. Um, and so why now? Why has it come back now? And, and how is it so relevant? Um, and one of the main reasons is actually a kind of convergence of technology that's been driven by mobile phones. So it's thanks to the mobile phone market that the re screen resolutions are high enough, that the, the screens themselves are cheap enough and light enough, um, gyroscopes and accelerometers, it all comes from mobile phones. And so because of the amount of them that they're producing, it makes virtual reality a viable media right now. And in terms of like how big it's going to be, um, Zuckerberg and Facebook, obviously, they bought the biggest player in virtual reality for $2 billion last year. And Mark Zuckerberg says himself that he thinks virtual reality is going to be part of our daily life for millions of people around the world. And in terms of the kind of scale of the industry, you're looking at around $30 billion by 2020 um, as a prediction. And in terms of the number of headsets sold, in 2017 alone, they're looking to sell around 12 million headsets. And um, the main players at the moment, Samsung, Google, Oculus, Sony, HTC, and there seems to be a kind of gap there, and that's got to be for Apple, hasn't it? There's been a huge amount of murmurs in that front. Um, they've put patents out there, and I know of a few people who've been interviewed, so uh, hopefully we'll see something from them soon. And they're all releasing their own different headsets. Each one's got its own advantages and disadvantages, but there's a huge amount to choose from already. But these are all going to be launched next year, apart from the Samsung Gear VR, which is going to be in the next few weeks. So in Q1 and Q2 next year, these headsets are all going to be coming onto the market. Um, but how many people in here have actually tried VR before, as a show of hands? OK, good. So the majority of people. Um, when you've got a VR headset on, it's got the very unique ability to completely transport you somewhere else. But above and beyond that as well, it, it's also able to really emotionally connect with people. Um, PlayStation VR did a demo recently where they had you sitting next to a, a young girl and you're meant to be giving her lessons in, in teaching. And when you look at her, she gets too close to you and she starts whispering in your ear and you actually start feeling very flustered and you get embarrassed and you blush. And it's that kind of power that VR's got to really emotionally connect with people, which makes it so exciting in retail. Um, so just a quick look at some of the things that are happening in retail now. Um, we've worked with Thomas Cook to do a campaign with them called Try Before You Fly. And you can actually take a five-minute holiday in a lot of their stores and then decide if you want to book it. Um, off the back of this, they found that um, there's a 190% increase in people booking holidays after trying it in VR. So they're rolling it, rolling it out everywhere. Um, Audi's another really good user of VR in retail at the moment. Um, they've got these city center showrooms that just don't have anything like the space they need to show all their ranges. So using VR headsets, you can go on these um, really amazing experiences where you actually meet the designer and he takes you around the car and then takes you for a drive in it. Um, but what's changing in VR and how's it going to affect the way that VR is in the future and, and in retail? Um, some of the main things include these kind of peripherals. This is the Oculus Touch handsets, and so using this, you can actually interact with things in the environment. So it becomes a lot less passive. You can actually t uh, pick things up, throw them, press all kinds of buttons, and use joysticks on it. Then also you've got the resolution of the headsets. So at the moment, you can clearly see the pixels, but as, as the headsets get a higher res, um, you, you won't be able to see the pixels so much. It'll feel a lot more real. And then also there's, there's tracking. Positional tracking is really important in VR. The ability to be able to actually walk around an environment is, is going to be a lot more frequent. At the moment, only certain headsets, like the HTC headset, actually allow you to explore a space. But that's going to come from all the mobile ones soon over the next few years. 
Um, so how is VR going to get into the household, or how are people going to start, where's the consumer market going to come from? At the moment, it's always been kind of VIP experiences for brands, but everyone's waiting for this consumer market, and that's going to be primarily pushed by gaming. Um, there's going to be PlayStation VR and Steam with its HTC Vive and the Oculus. Everybody who, any gamer worth their salt is going to want to be inside Call of Duty or inside the games that they love. And thanks to that, there's going to be headsets in a huge number of homes that can be used by retailers, using entertainment, film. So following on from, from gaming, uh, entertainment's following fast. Already the music industry is really getting into VR. This is um, just a, a frame we shot from an Imagine Dragons gig a couple of weeks ago. And we're already talking to a lot of other artists about capturing their gigs and doing music videos for them. Um, Sports uh, got heavily into VR already as well. This is um, the NBA, where they've been live streaming VR um, games. And um, the film industry is, is really moving hard into VR too. I mean, Ridley Scott's just been working in it. Uh, but there's been a huge amount of issues that they've come up against. And one of the really unique things with VR is that when you get it wrong, you've got the unfortunate um, ability to actually make people feel physically ill. And that's something which has been really challenging filmmakers. Because um, all these techniques and all these learnings over all the years for making films just don't apply in VR. Quick cuts disorientate people. Turning a camera makes people feel ill. All these things. So everyone's had to learn everything from scratch. And so the whole VR industry is taking its time to build up for, v for VR filmmaking. Uh, there's the education and training side of things, which is absolutely vital, especially when it comes to things like doctors. Or imagine you know, learning how to do bomb disposal. It's going to be a lot safer in VR. Um, but coming back to retail, um, 3D scanning and photogrammetry are absolutely vital. You can scan any object beautifully. That's a scan of a trainer. And then using your Oculus Touch or your peripherals, you can pick it up in the virtual space, turn it around, look at it in great detail. And also scanning real places. So you can use 3D scans of actual incredible locations. I mean, like, for example, Harrods is a one-off building. Um, they might want to scan their entire location, and then you can have people shopping there virtually from anywhere around the world. Um, but moving away from the real, what's going to be quite exciting for brands is the more fantastical. So for a brand like Nike, um, who've got this brilliant kind of dark stores with this neon lighting, it looks really stunning, they could have an infinite number of rows and infinite size of building and layout, and they can actually have something which completely defies gravity because you're in a virtual world. It doesn't need to be a set floor space. You don't need to negotiate your rent or worry about anything when it comes to building a set. And then you can have Ronaldo walk out from the, from the aisles and, and talk to you, um, or, or Rooney. Um, so you can actually have this kind of VIP shopping experience. I mean, imagine going for your bling shopping with JLo at Swarovski. Um, and and in, in this way, you can really tailor this to, to individual consumers. Um, at the moment, you know, lots of brands like Red Bull are doing a lot of VIP, a lot of kind of very scary, exciting, action-packed experiences as well, just to kind of um, associate with their brands. And I, I, I see that only getting more and more exciting and there being more of it. Um, also, I mean, in the same way that shopping is tailored online, shopping will be tailored in VR as well. I mean, think about Flipboard, where you can choose your favorite um, things, you know, autos, cricket, tech, whatever you like. Um, and then the shop that you go in is always tailored like that around you. And as you walk around it and explore it, you're being shown stuff that is only relevant to you. Um, and also, as the peripherals get better, you'll be able to pick things up in the virtual world and actually start to feel them and, and, and play with them before you actually have to buy them. And when haptics come along, which is where you can actually start to get real feedback from the environment, you'll be able to feel that drill going down into the wood or feel a surface as you push against it. And that's going to make shopping for objects like, you know, I mean, I've got an example of drills here. It's going to make it feel incredibly real. Um, but one of the great things of VR is actually the ability to be in there and not isolated. And with something like property, the idea that you could have um, a client in Dubai, a property in London, and an estate agent in Manchester, and you can put your headsets on, and you can see where each other are looking, and you can talk to each other, because you've actually got a mobile phone as part of the headset. So it's all built in there already. The technology is already there. And that's a huge cost saving for any property company. And VR being social is absolutely vital. And this is something which Facebook's obviously incredibly keen to, to push hard. Um, there's actually a, an Oculus demo called Toybox. And when you're in there, you've got your Oculus Touch controllers. 
and you can pick up all these things, and there's a person opposite you, crucially, and they're represented by a head and a pair of hands, and they're telling you what to do. They're an Oculus representative. And, and, and that was a really magic moment when you realize that that person is actually real who's in there with you. And this is a perfect extension of what it could be like to have you know, a real person in a virtual environment selling you something, so doing a product demo. And by that extension as well, then why not be there with all your friends? So, if, I mean, let's say you, uh, you could get your body scanned. You could get your body 3D scanned, a perfect version of you for your avatar in the virtual world, and so would your friends. And then you could go to your, uh, let's say you want to go for your bride dress shopping, and so you go off with your bridesmaids, and you, you try your, it's a real cliche in VR, the future of VR is, oh, let's all try on virtual clothes and see how they look on our avatars. But you can imagine doing that, and then, you know, looking back and asking your friends, does my avatar's bum look big in this? But it, and it's all going to be possible really soon. Um, Ernest Klein's book, Ready Player One, um, actually speaks about the future of VR, the kind of more distant future of VR, and this world called the metaverse. And the idea with the metaverse is that it's a, a collection of virtual worlds which you can explore, which have no grounding in the real world. It's absolutely fantastical. So you can have all of these kind of virtual shops there and the virtual currency and objects that you can buy can do far more than you could do with any objects in the real world. And we've got a taste for this in the Oculus Toy Box demo where you pick something up and you can kind of throw some sticks of dynamite or you can smash a ball which changes gravity. And if that's the case and people are able to have objects that they could never normally afford in the real world, then do they start to value the virtual world more? which is a kind of crazy and slightly worrying thought of people getting lost in this metaverse in the future. So in conclusion, um, VR is an incredibly powerful medium which is going to hit us in a big way next year. And at the moment, people have only just been experimenting it with it kind of for VIP experiences, but I'm super excited to see how it's going to be used in retail and see those consumer headsets coming into the homes. Thank you. So let me get this right, Henry. We'll be shopping in a virtual store that doesn't exist with a virtual J. Lo, with our <laughs> avatars rather than our friends, with robots delivering the Drones, Nikes yeah, yeah. back to our house. And where do human beings in real space fit into this future world, do you think? Well, I think by 3D scanning human beings and all being there and seeing people beautifully represented, and if you get it right, and, and in VR there's this, this term of presence where if you get the VR so good, you actually forget it's not real for a moment. And that sense of presence is how you could see your friends represented in there, and they would be very real. So give us an idea of some e-commerce companies that are already talking to you, what they're looking for from you, and what at this stage you're able to deliver. Um, for e-commerce, most of the work that we do is based in advertising and brands, and it's more of the kind of stunt side of things at the moment, or documentary filmmaking. Um, and the big hurdle at stopping e-commerce and VR at the moment is the lack of a big marketplace. So once, um, I mean, once the Oculus uh, store uh, connects with people's phones and connects with their accounts for payments, then it will be a very simple case of just you know, tapping a headset or using your hands, depending on what peripherals you've got, to acknowledge a payment. And then when you come off the, take the headset off, I'm sure you'll probably have to fill out details or a security check for now. Give a piece of advice to the retail professionals in the audience, how they need to go back and start planning for the next, I guess, five years ahead. I think I would start, start thinking about what kind of virtual presence you want. And if you're not constrained by the real world, um, you can make something absolutely fantastic that represents your brand, a really nice place for people to visit, or a really exciting experience that you could give to any customer. And bear in mind that you can, you, yeah, as you have no constraints in the real world, I just let you cast your mind out and make something really exciting. Great. And we can visualize some of your work with yep. some VR headsets upstairs in the networking break. Yeah, absolutely. We're up at the back in the corner, yeah. Thank you, Henry, for joining us. Thank you. The 3D future. Thank you.